Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dignitaries, comrades, we had them all on the list, representatives of the media and civil society, friends and colleagues. First of all, on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and the South African Civil Society Information Service, I would like to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion on taking stock of South Africa's two 2014 general elections. To our panelists, dear Numboni Sogasas, dear, dear Stephen Friedman, Adam Habib, and Johnny Steinberg, we greatly appreciate you being here tonight and to share with us. Most importantly, I thank all of you for joining in and being part of this important discussion. My name is Renate Tembusch and I'm the resident director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Johannesburg. I'm representing the foundation and its political core values, which are rooted in social democracy here in South Africa. And I'm managing our national, regional and global programs aimed at promoting democracy and solidarity. 2014 is a big year for elections, all across Europe, Asia, America, and Africa. From the biggest democracy in the world, India, to troubled countries like the Ukraine and Syria, via the European Union and the USA, to the Southern African region, where all in all five countries, Malawi, Botswana, Mozambique, Namibia, and South Africa, are holding general elections this year. Voters around the world are making their mark towards choosing their representatives they think will lead their society in the best possible path for the future. In this year's elections, the Indian National Congress lost the majority to the right-wing Hindu Nationalist Party, BGP, of Nahindra Modi. With only two interruptions, the INC ruled the country since independence in 1947. But now the voters seem to have lost trust in the ability of Gandhi's Congress Party to solve the immense challenges in terms of poverty, inequality, and unemployment the country is facing. In South Africa, the African National Congress, as we all know, once again managed to gain the majority of the votes and will be ruling South Africa for another five years. But the voting trends reflected in the results clearly indicate that the general voter turnout, as well as the support for the ANC, in particular in the metros, is declining. However, nationally and internationally political analysts expected a bigger loss for the ANC and its current leadership. But it seems that neither Marikana nor the corruption scandals and the massive service delivery protest and even not the actual crisis South Africa is facing with high unemployment rates, rising inequality and poverty, social unrest, and an overall economic decline were playing a determining role at the ballot for the majority of the traditional ANC supporters. Analysts believe that once again, the one in, uh, 11 and a half million votes for the ANC were rather based on history than actual policies. But they predict that in future election, elections, policies will determine support for the African National Congress. The former and the future President Jacob Zuma indicated that the ANC interprets the election results as a green light from the South Africans for implementing the government's 30-year blueprint for development, the National Development Plan. What does that mean for the voters who are definitely expecting a more inclusive policy? Social democratic ideas and values have been entrenched in ANC policy framework since the 1940s. These include the state provision of universal and socially inclusive education, health, housing, and welfare benefits to citizens as a basic right. The goal of full, un full employment and a social compact between labor, capital, and government based on the maintenance of a social welfare state and collective bargaining stretch back to the African's Claims document of 1943, were reaffirmed in the Freedom Charter under Abut Lutuli and formed the basis of the redistribution and development program. But following the worldwide neoliberal trend, the focus shifted from redistribution to fiscal stability and growth. The ratio was that growth lifts all boats and leads to redistribution through the trickle-down effect. Given the levels of wealth concentration and in um, income inequality, globally and also in South Africa, it becomes obvious there is no truth to this very simplistic view of the relationship between growth, jobs, and income share. 
The economist Thomas Piketty, in his recently published work, Capital in the 21st Century, has pointed out that globally gains at the, gains at the top have been unpre unprecedented and this extreme concentration of wealth affects the very nature of political life and national economic health as well. The downward pressure on labor costs and job losses, coupled with the fact that the top highest earners have seen major wage increases, not only mean the disenfranchisement of labor's share of income, but overall economic growth itself is constrained. So, one of the questions for me today will be, today will be what basic principles will guide the implementation of the National Development Plan of the re-elected ANC government in the next five years and beyond? Will Rutuli's vision of a social democratic welfare state in combination and completed with progressive and alternative sustainable social and economic policies be the path for the future in South Africa? And will in consequence inequality, unemployment and poverty in South Africa be reversed? And last but not least, what implications will this have on the upcoming municipal, elec municipal elections in 2016 and the general elections in 2019? Having said this, I am looking forward to an interesting debate where we will get some answers to these and more questions while taking stock of South Africa's 2014 general elections. But before I hand over to Fasila Farouk, who will moderate this discussion between this esteemed panel of guests, as well as with you, our audience, I would like to thank Fasila and her team for organizing this very important debate. Thank you, Fasila, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Renata, and welcome everybody on behalf of SACSIS. Um, our interest in hosting this event was to assess the outcome of, the South Africa, of South Africa's fifth general election from a social justice perspective. And I think Renata has done a fantastic job sketching the context in uh, outlining the social justice challenges facing us as a country, the growing inequality, the poor service delivery, a government that's racked with corruption, a president that gets booed, and yet, through it all, the ANC manages to get voted into power once again. My role here today is to um, facilitate the discussion, and it's going to be really, very simple. Um, I've got uh, four fantastic speakers who really need no introduction. Um, so our lineup is going to uh, go like this. Adam's going to speak first. And I'm putting you on the spot, I didn't tell you. <laughs> um, followed by Johnny, and then Nombo Niso, and then um, Stephen. Um, when I engaged these panelists um, to come and speak to us today about this event, I sent them a list of questions which I, th which I thought would be important for framing the discussion. So I'm going to go through those questions because they're going to be um, responding to those issues that I raised. Um, given the outcome of South Africa's 2014 general re election, I mean, what do these outcomes say about the quality of South Africa's democracy? Um, do identity politics play any role in the way that South Africans vote? We've just seen that uh, white South Africans voted almost as a block for the Democratic Alliance. President Zuma's first term in office was tainted by corruption scandals and an authoritarian state. So what can we expect from the Zuma presidency in his second term? Um, the ANC has done incredibly well. Team Zuma is likely emboldened by the ANC 62% win at the polls. And how will this affect the fractured politics of the tripartite alliance? And how will it also affect the fragile truce inside Kosatu at the moment? <coughs> Given the... Uh, fairly good showing that the Democratic Alliance had in this election, are we still likely to see, to see political opposition coming from the left in the form of a possible workers' party and that having some kind of impact um, in the run-up to election 2019? Or has the pendulum swung to the right again with the DA's good showing in this election? So I'm hoping that our panel will be able to engage with all, if not, with, with some, if not all of these issues. Um, and, you know, for the benefit of people who are going to be watching um, this discussion on the SACSIS website, because we film everything and post it on our website, I'd just like to introduce 
um, Adam Habib. Um, Adam Habib is a professor of political science and the current vice chancellor of Wits University. Um, he's also a former deputy vice chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. He's published many books and his most recent book is titled South Africa's Suspended Revolution. Adam? Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, colleagues, thank you for inviting me. I think that uh, those questions are interesting, but I thought that there was a more provocative question that was phrased originally, uh, and that was uh, following what President Zuma said, is that the ANC will be ruling uh, until, until Jesus uh, comes. And, and, and that, I thought, was an interesting phrasing of the question, because what it, I think, suggests is when President Zuma makes a statement like that, it suggests that there is, at the heart of the ANC, a level of complacency. And what I was particularly uh, attracted to in these results was the fact that these results, I think, send a very strong message uh, to both the ANC and to the DA that they, can, that they shouldn't be complacent. That actually these results uh, are quite powerful and suggest and send significant messages out to suggest that South Africa is going to be a society that's likely to undergo some fundamental changes over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years. And the first quite striking thing is that, is despite the fact that people might say that the ANC has done well, it's worth bearing in mind that the Zuma administration has now lost votes in two elections. In the first, from about 70% to about 66, and the second from 66 to about 62. And, and, and that's something that should, is sending ripple effects into the party. The second is that if you go away from the national results, there are even more worrying uh, uh, shifts happening at provincial level. Uh, so Gauteng's dropped to 10%. And the EFF's uh, vote of 10, at least 10% in Gauteng. The fact that the ANC marginally won in a number of the big urban metropoles, Nelson Mandela, it fell below 50%, and in uh, Kuleleni, Tswane, and, and in Johannesburg, just slightly above that. These are powerful signals to the ANC that you should be thinking very hard about what these elections mean for you. Because if you seriously want to be a party of modernity, and the ANC often describes itself as a nationalist party of modernity, then these results suggest that you're in trouble. Because if you lose the middle classes and you uh, lose the urban metropoles, you're exactly in the place where ZANU PF was. And that's something that you want to start thinking through very, very seriously. The second is that um, the strong showing of the EFF, it seems to me, sends a very powerful message that the real gap in the electorate is to the left of the ANC, not to the right. And that if you look at the, AN, the DA's results, if you listen to Helen Ziller, she will say to you that we've jumped quite consistently every election, and she's right. But in 2009, it jumped to 16% from 12, and then in 2014, uh, it jumped to 20, uh, 22%. Uh, but uh, it is interesting that compared to the local government elections, which was 24%, uh, it didn't jump as much. Uh, it is interesting that it's got to ask why in places like Marikana and in other places where people get turned off the ANC in such dramatic ways, but they refuse to vote for, for the DA and what does that mean for the DA's politics and what does it stand for. And in part, if the electorate is on to the left of the a a a ANC, the real gap, the real challenge it has is how is it going to deal and how can it project itself uh, to appeal to that lot. And, and, and the one thing that's quite striking is that even in its imagery, the DA hasn't been capable of uh, being able to do this. So what is striking is that in the midst of a, a massacre in Marikana, in any other country in the world, the opposition would have been there, the official and opposition would have been there the next day. The ANC, the DA wasn't anywhere to be seen in Marikana. It was Julius Malema and one or two others who went to Marikana, but not, not the DA. And what does it sell about them and how that was read by people? So I do think that there's powerful signals going out. I want to quickly look at those questions. 
what does this mean for the quality of democracy and what does it mean for identity politics? You know, for me, it does, does the fact that there's a large degree of correlation uh, impact on people, uh, a, a large degree of correlation between race and the way people vote? Is, of course there is. It's quite clear. The one thing, however, is I think you need to make an assumption, do not make too late, that this is a kind of irrational vote. That even given the overlaps between class and race and other identities in South Africa, I think there could be very, very rational reasons for why you would vote in a particular way. And, and, and this is not simply a vote simply defined by irrationality or simply by the fact that the DA has a white leader. It is informed by much more complex considerations, part of which is do you represent our interests and do we feel that you can kind of articulate our interests in this historical epoch? And I do think that there's a really interesting conversation to be had about some of these issues. On the issue of the Zuma presidency, I'm not so sure that they're going to be sanguine. I think the mere fact that they chose David Makura to become premier in Gauteng suggests that there's some serious ripple effects happening. And that even at the heart of Lutuli House, there's a, there's a question mark about what does the Gauteng results mean for us? And what does it say about whether we're doing enough? I'm not so sure, however, that it's going to address the kind of social democratic vision that we want to talk about. Because the one thing that it seems to me is you're still getting complex signals out of the ANC. And the thing that frightens me about the National Development Plan, I think that there's a lot of positive things in this plan. But I think it ducks the fundamental question at the heart of the economy. And that is how to address inequality. And the National Development Plan's uh, plan about dealing with inequality is by going after poverty. And the hope is that if you go after poverty, somehow you'll miraculously deal with inequality. And I think that the real question is you can actually address poverty, as has happened in China and in India and in other places, without addressing inequality, in fact, of aggravating inequality. And part of that uh, has demonstrated itself in South Africa over the last 20 years. And the real dilemma we need to deal with is how do you deal with, by dealing with poverty, getting growth going, people on the top end grow faster than the guys at the bottom end because they have assets, stocks, bonds. And that question uh, is, is something that has been ducked. And I want to end with a look at the left. I do think that the interesting thing about the EFF is it shows that the party, that there is a gap in the, on the left of the ANC. But I don't think that the EFF on its own represents that. And so part of the vote for the EFF, I think, is a protest vote. If you want to go in, into that, uh, po uh, if you want to go into that electoral uh, election uh, poll, and you want to then look at who to vote for, and you want to send a message to the ANC, one of the ways you do so is to vote for the prodigal son of the ANC, which is the EFF, because that will irritate Jacob Zuma far more than had you voted for for Helen Zilla. And that was the logic for a fair degree of people who voted for the EFF. The thing that it sends to me is that if you had a more coherent party to the left of, 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 of the ANC, one coming out of the trade union movement, one that has legitimacy, which is something that NUMSA, NUMSA's evolution of a party could have, one that has no organizational infrastructure because it's based in the trade union movement, one that has access to money, it could pro perform fairly well. The challenge for that party, however, is it runs the risk of narrowly appealing to the working class. And it runs the risk of constructing the alternatives in such extreme ways that sometimes I see in the language, not in the documentation, but in the language of some of the personalities, that you could actually mitigate the potential you have. The great conversation that often happens on the, when you, people talk about the left is they look at the PT. The real lesson of the PT is it might be predicated on the labor movement, but as a party, it appealed to a much wider generation of people. It, it appealed to a much wider generation of people than simply the organized working class. And that the trick of something coming out of Kosato has to be that it can't simply be appealing to the organized workers. It must be constructed in a language and in a policy agenda and in an imagery that can appeal to a wider layer than simply the organized workers. The organized workers can be an important component of that alliance, 
but it must appeal to the lower middle classes, to the irate liberal intellectuals in the upper middle classes, the unemployed, all of those kinds of categories, uh, very much as the way the PT did. And I wonder whether there is that kind of imagination and political courage in parts of, 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 of the union movement who are talking about this. So I have that, for me, is the big, big uh, question as we move forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Adam. I'm now going to hand over to Johnny Steinberg. Um, for those of you who don't know Johnny, um, you must be reading his column in the Sunday Times, because he writes regularly in the Sunday Times, and Business Day, and Business Day. So Johnny Steinberg is a South African writer and scholar. He has a doctorate in political theory from the University of Oxford, um, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He's currently, he is currently a lecturer in African studies at the University of Oxford, and he's the author of several books, which I won't mention. You can go and Google them, because it was a formidable list when I had a look. Um, and I also just want to thank Johnny for coming all the way, especially from uh, Oxford, to this meeting. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks a lot, Fazil. It's um, very nice to be here. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask you to join me in a, a speculative exercise, but not about the future, about the past. And I mean, imagine in May 1994, if the leadership of the ANC were gathered and told a story about what would happen in an election 20 years hence. And the story went like this. The platinum boom went seriously out of control. You know, the government, uh, capital labor, lost control over it. Workers began living in informal settlements without services. Uh, the NUM cozied up to management and ended up losing the majority of the workforce. That, that really assembled in a violent insurgency um, and, and, and rebelled against its own union and management. The police came out and killed 35 of them. It turns out that several of those were killed in cold blood. And if you'd asked the, la the, the leadership of the ANC in 1994, what would the electoral consequences of that be? I suspect that they would have been pretty scared. I don't think anyone in 1994 would have imagined that the electoral consequences of that would have been pretty close to zero. You know, they lost a few wards in Rustenburg. Um, back in the Eastern Cape, where 70,000 striking workers come from, the ANC did very well. Um, I, I think it's a surprise. I think that it's something that requires some explanation. Um, I think that the ANC has been enormously successful, and, and I think perhaps surprised itself over the long term, and how successful it's been um, in dictating the terms of a conversation. Um, in, in giving authority to its own interpretation of events. And, you know, in January I was in um, uh, Port St. John's and Lusiki Siki um, talking to people I've gotten to know there over the last decade. You know, all of them know miners. All of them know people who've been on strike. All of them know of people who were killed that day in Marikana. Um, and I certainly didn't do a census, and I can't tell you that I've looked into the hearts and minds of all people in, in that part of the world, but just talking to people I've gotten to know well, the, their take on the strike was so interesting. They were enormously sympathetic to the wage issue. Um, they, they felt for the families of workers um, uh, who were not getting wages. Very, very few people were for the strike. Um, a great ambivalence about the strike. And when I asked why, I mean, the question of violence comes up again and again, and what it means. And it seemed to me pretty clear that, that the workers had lost a symbolic battle over what violence means, and the ANC had won it. And what I was hearing from pretty poor people, you know, in, in, in the former Trans Sky, was that they were scared of violence. They were scared of mine workers' violence, because they interpreted it as an attack on new institutions in which they were proud, um, as an attack on gains. Um, you know, an enormous identification with the new order and the ANC through it, you know, despite the fact that unemployment is very, very high, uh, despite the fact that people haven't done, uh, many people have not done well. Um, and it just, it, it struck me how the ANC in those parts of the world, um, its interpretation of events was so powerful, so hegemonic. And I think part of the reason is 
in the last 20 years, the ANC really has knitted itself into everyday life in those parts of the world. I mean, I'm talking about the eastern seaboard. I'm talking about rural South Africa and small towns. It's done so th partly through its incumbency, you know, through the fact that it delivers welfare. Um, it, in fact, delivers or has come to seen, be seen as associated with delivering most forms of upward mobility um, in, in those areas of the country over 20 years. Um, and the result is that people moving upwards, people with authority, people with respect, um, are associated with the organization in one way or another. I think, it's, I think it has really captured in those parts of the country what it means over the last 20 years to be black and to aspire uh, beyond its own expectations. Um, and, I mean, that surprised me. I, you know, when Marikana happened, a number of things came to my mind and a number of possible interpretations of people in the Eastern Cape. And one is that in 1960, famously, as everybody in the Eastern Cape knows, uh, 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 people in rebellion were, were um, gunned down um, on a hill. You know, the geography was very, very similar to Marikana. Um, and the great legacy, uh, or, or the name associated with that moment, is Buerza Zikrao, um, know, known universally now in those parts as a sellout. And I was wondering whether Marikana might not be integrated into that history, um, and the NUM and the ANC uh, seen as a latter-day Buerza Zikrao. Uh, that didn't come anywhere close to happening. And for me, what that means is that I think that the ANC has got to a position in rural South Africa and small-town South Africa where it can absorb a great deal of anger and disappointment and disenchantment um, and, and has a language in which to talk about those things while retaining support. So, I mean, I hate to speculate. I think every time I've thought about what might happen in the near future, I've been wrong. Um, but, but I think the ANC has much of rural South Africa and small town South Africa sewn up for the foreseeable future. I think that it's demonstrated that it can take very, very serious hits and come back from them. It's, it's sufficiently ingrained in the world to, to keep having a voice in it for a long time. Um, I mean, as for all the areas where the ANC support has declined across metropolitan South Africa, um, you know, an important difference is that the ANC isn't stitched into the everyday lives of, of South Africa's new burgeoning middle class and in the upper ranks of, of organized workers. Their lives are different. Their relation to the ANC is different. Um, and I think that perhaps what all the political parties have, have failed in regards to low-level civil servants, um, uh, university students, um, organized workers, is, is the enormous, enormous insecurity and uncertainty of upward mobility in a city like Johannesburg. Um, the amount of debt it comes with, um, uh, the incapacity to plan a future, the, the family obligations with poor relatives. Um, I, I think that a lot of urban South Africa is experiencing the, the drift in ANC leadership and corruption as, as a source of instability, as feeding into their own personal insecurity. Um, but I also think that the ANC has enormous reserves of, of, of memory, of history, of loyalty, even there. And, and the very fact that Jacob Zuma won't be running the next election campaign may be an enormous fillip to the ANC in urban areas. Um, I mean, I think a great deal depends on a leadership uh, with the style and the language and the presence to speak to people. And I don't think it takes that much for the ANC to draw on those reserves because they're quite deep and quite powerful. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if the ANC gets more than 62% in the next election. Uh, I, I think that it has the rural areas and I think that, um, I think that if, re if it recalibrates its relationship to cities, it still has a head start over others. Uh, so that's my two cents worth for the moment. Thank you, Johnny. We'll get a chance for discussion and questions afterwards. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Nambo Niso now. Uh, Nambo Niso Gaza is an analyst, a researcher, a writer, editor, a public speaker, and an activist, and a feminist. Um, <laughs> And um, I'm going to hand over to her, and she's going to tell us a little bit more also about the organizations that she's affiliated with before she speaks. No, that's going to child my 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Um, I wish I'd spoken before Johnny, actually. Um, but now that I have, I think I have nothing to say. Um, um, well, I'm glad that um, you ditched the question um, that you'd posed, will the ANC r rule until Jesus Christ comes? Um, because I would have gotten into a very long debate about my discomfort um, deriving from feminist humanitics, uh, but also um, uh, a, you know, contemporary and, um, and historical politics around um, leadership that takes itself or that is taken to be um, ordained by the powers above. Um, how do we read the, the past elections? It's very intriguing to me that um, throughout this conversation, uh, there is a tilt towards not seeing rural South Africa as in, a, in disaggregated ways. Um, he, you know, Johnny has spoken about the impact of the of 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 the strikes and the fear of violence, um, but that really is in Eastern Pondoland in the main, um, uh, in terms of your concentration. And I always find it very fascinating the way we talk about South Africa. The drop in the metros means something, but you know what? Um, the, the fact that the NCA has gotten the rural vote, Adam says it's going to go, probably there's a possibility that it's going to go the ZANU-PF way, as if rural South Africa is one um, um, homogenous and monolithic um, space that is inhabited by people who think and respond and feel the same way. Um, let me start by saying, I'm going to be very brief, let me start by saying, as long as elections and the conversation around elections is determined by the ANC, as Johnny has said um, correctly, as long as they frame both the parameters of the conversation and the content of the conversation, I think that they're going to win. Uh, by slim majority, perhaps, there are going to be drops here and there, but I think that when they, um, if our imagination is um, limited to what the ANC wants to talk about or any other political party for that matter, I think that they're going to win because they're going to be able to dodge the more serious issues that um, might lose them um, the, 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 the kind of support that they would want to get. Um, the, the second issue for me is that, frankly, whether the ANC rules until the next century, it doesn't bother me. I don't subscribe to the dogma of circulating power amongst the elites and that if you have a different political party, then you have more democracy and that is vibrant and so on. I, I don't subscribe to that at all. The question for me is what kind of ANC or what kind of political party and what kind of democracy, the quality, the question that you're asking about the quality of democracy, the implications for the quality of democracy. And I would like to suggest that the quality of democracy in terms of the kind of work that I do, in terms of the experiences of the people that I, that I interact with in, in other parts of rural South Africa, including Pondoland, but also in the, in the more middle, more dry, part of South Africa, the quality of our democracy is very poor. But when I compare um, that place where I come from, which is Gofumbaba, and, and I compare where that place was when I grew up and where that place is now, poor as that quality of democracy that we're talking about and quality of life is, I am very sure that the NC doesn't have to speak loud or doesn't have to dig deeper yet in memory to say this is what we've achieved, this is what we have done. So when they frame the conversation, they frame the conversation in a way that um, obscures the very, very complex issues um, that, um, that might in fact force them to lose support in, in rural areas. The, the second issue for me is that whether the ANC um, wins election or loses them as I think it's given, it depends on what the electorate thinks. And what the electorate thinks is also dependent on what it is that is being amplified. So 
I want for a minute to talk about how we obscure and we do not understand and we do not think it's worthy to understand the complexity of rural life in South Africa and the ways in which at the level of democracy, the ways in which the laws that are being reproduced that are, that are taking them back, the way in which people are becoming more and more impoverished, our inability to understand the relationship between land and mining, the rationale between the land restitution bill that we have had, that we have, um, uh, which has been passed in parliament, and, and the ownership of resources. Uh, Malima um, can be as demagoguery as he wants to be, or can be as, and any left can be as left as they want to be if they don't understand the fact that in Gonyama Trust, when King Zolitini says, I will get all the children of Uzulu, all the people of Uzulu to make one claim, one land claim, he, and we will, as in Gonyama Trust, we will divide that land fairly. It's a play on identity, we think, it's a play on history and memory, we think, but actually it's much more shrewd than that. If you look at the kind of vast tracts of land that Ingonyama Trust owns, which is where the economy and the future economy of this country is, um, we are missing a point. The metropolitans are in the long run not going to be where the rich, the wealth of this country is going to be coming from. Uh, the, the, second, the third point for me, therefore, is the way in which the opposition itself fashions itself in the image of the ANC says something about the power of symbolism and the power of um, the presence that the ANC has. So we have two leaders, the leader of the ruling party and the leader of the opposition party, out dancing each other on the stage and out singing each other and both actually being extremely irritatingly off tune, <laughs> but being extremely uh, entertaining and um, or embarrassing or cringeworthy if you if you are fussy like me, right? So and and you find a situation where the DA is not able to say this is what we stand for. So we we fought for struggle too. Remember, we also have. So in my view, it it shows the extent to which the ANC narrative has captured the imagination of South Africa. Um, and, and, and the extent to which it's very difficult for people to think about today's politics, today's life in, 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 in ways that, that transcend that, ima that, 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 that imagination. Finally, like Johnny, I believe that the ANC is felt much more powerfully on an everyday life in parts of rural South Africa than it is in, 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 in some parts of urban South Africa. Uh, my sister uh, says she went to vote and what she did was that she couldn't bear voting for Jacob Zuma. So she put a thumb on the face of Jacob Zuma and then she voted for the ANC, <laughs> right? Uh, so I say to her, so, um, Honestly, it's on Facebook. I said to her, so what the hell, what the difference does that make? And then she says, well, I don't know, but the thing is, I'd, you know, Helen Zillek grates my uh, whatever. And, 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 and I said, yeah, but uh, the thing is that you assume that the problem is with, Hel with Jacob Zuma. She says, look, I know. But, and I, she didn't, she, she makes it very clear. She says, I didn't vote for the ANC because I lacked options. I had an option. And the option I had was not to vote. I voted for the ANC because I have a complex relationship with the ANC. I could ask anybody here to talk about whether you have not lived in a dysfunctional relationship, knowing that it is very dysfunctional, that actually the best way is for you to leave. Um, but for some reason or the other, you've not actually gotten to the point where you need um, to, 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 to do so. And actually, quite frankly, divorce is very expensive, right? And uh, political divorce is also, it's very costly at emotional level, at psychological level. So I think it's an issue that, that we need to understand at a much more nuanced level than we have. The, the fear that people have of mine workers' strike in the part of um, Eastern Cape that I come from, 
manifests itself in different ways. I come from a generation that received bodies and bodies and bodies of dead mine workers, of women who sat at the feet of, rows and rows of women who sat at the feet of um, coffins of, 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 of people who were killed in the, in, in, in the mines during Ngata, NUM, during um, uh, even you know, mine violence, the scabs, and so on and so forth. So what labor uh, may consider to be a powerful tool for themselves um, sends different messages elsewhere. Um, as you were thinking about Musa Hill, I was thinking about Bull Hook, actually, um, and wrote about that after Margana. And it is interesting to me that in mainstream conversations, those kinds of, con those kinds of associations that people were having with Margana at deeply spiritual level in rural Eastern Cape, they did not feature. So I believe that the kind of leadership that we get, I'm talking now to us as uh, middle class and above and so on, uh, the kind of leadership that we have is in some ways the kind of leadership that we've produced in the myths and mythology that we continue to produce. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nambonisa. I'm now going to hand over to Stephen, but um, before you speak, Stephen, let me just introduce you properly. Stephen, of course, you all know from his column at Business Day, he's also an academic. Um, he directs the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, and Stephen's book, Building Tomorrow Today, African Workers in Trade Unions, 1970 to 1984, has been described as a classic South African text. By who? <laughs> By and the why? people who wrote your Wikipedia page. <laughs> oh, somebody put that on Wikipedia. People put very strange stuff on it. Uh, this is not part of my 10 minutes, but having listened to the other speakers, I, I, I can't resist sharing this. Uh, the stuff about the ANC ruling until Jesus comes. Uh, my friend Aubrey Matiki, who some of you may know, who writes, also writes columns, uh, is actually claims to be, I'm not quite sure how it works, but claims to be a reasonably serious Christian. So when, when Jacob Zuma said this, Aubrey wrote this wonderful column in which he said he was so excited to learn that his savior was coming 20 years earlier than he'd had to <laughs> <laughs> And he, he thanked, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but anyway, that's got nothing to do with anything else I'm going to say. Um, look, I, I, I was asked to stick to a fairly narrow brief, but, but some of my colleagues have, have ex extended a bit, so I'll, I'll go somewhere in between. Uh, and the first point I want to make is that I, I do think that if we look at the numbers, and it is useful, I mean, most of what I do at the moment is political theory, but when I do this stuff, it's useful to look at numbers. Uh, the numbers do uh, support those uh, who argue that the ANC is in no particular danger of losing office anytime soon. Uh, if you have a look, uh, and I find this quite striking, uh, you know, there were all sorts of extraneous factors. If you have a look at what happened to the ANC vote in this election and you compare it to the previous election, it is just about identical. Uh, the ANC lost 3.7 percentage points last time, it lost 3.8 this time. If you work it out as a percentage, it lost 5.6 last time, 5.4 this time. Uh, and that indicates that if the ANC is in decline, uh, then uh, you're talking about a very slow puncture rather than a blowout. Uh, certainly on those statistical trends, uh, the ANC is, in, 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 is, is, is safe for, for 15 to 20 years uh, under current conditions. The second point is that, like my colleagues, I, I noticed the urban vote, and I think the urban vote is very interesting. Uh, and uh, like some of my colleagues, I got carried away by the urban vote, and I said, the ANC is in trouble in the urban areas. Uh, I then went back and did some, uh, some extra maths and, and came to the conclusion that actually the ANC isn't in trouble in the urban areas. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple. Uh, that is that in local government, we have, of course, a uh, half of the seats are uh, constituencies, are, are wards. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting to me that South Africans who get terribly enthusiastic about the constituency system seem to have forgotten how much the constituency system does to, to distort voter preferences. Uh, just for information, the, the, you know, the introductory speech mentioned Narendra Modi. Um, 
The BJP has just uh, frighteningly uh, won the biggest uh, electoral uh, land majority in India in 30 years. It got 31% of registered voters. That's what constituency systems do. So if you look at our urban areas, uh, the ANC, if you look at the areas which the ANC controls in uh, Nelson Mandela Metro, Joburg, Tswane, Ekurileni, etc., it would have to lose 30 percentage points to lose those wards. So the ANC, even if it drops below, even if it drops into the mid-40s, the ANC is going to start the next municipal elections uh, with about 40% uh, of the, the, the seats already sewn up. Uh, and therefore, it's not realistic to expect uh, uh, there to be uh, uh, hung uh, uh, councils in any of the major metros. Uh, maybe Nelson Mandela Bay at a push, because by my calculation, because of the demographics there, the ANC would uh, have to go down to about 40% in, in, in Nelson Mandela Metro to lose control. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, just to give you an indication, in, 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 in Joburg, by my calculations, the ANC vote would have to go down to 35% for it to lose control of Johannesburg. So we're not talking about some great electoral shift. Uh, if you look at the DA vote, and colleagues have talked about that, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's crude rule of th thumb stuff. Uh, the DA does now have a black constituency, but I think in the main that black constituency came from COPE. Uh, it didn't come from the ANC. Uh, uh, the uh, EFF, according to my colleague over here, has done very well. Uh, I, I, I remain the, the sole dissenter on that. Uh, uh, I don't think underperforming COPE uh, uh, in 2009 is all that impressive, particularly if you're presenting yourself as, 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 as the voice of the grassroots. I, I agree with those uh, column Johnny Steinberg wrote earlier this, this week uh, who, who see the EFF as, uh, uh, as an expression of, of, of a particular middle class sentiment, and there's obviously a distinct uh, lid on, 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 on how much mileage that has. So we're not looking at some great electoral game changer, unless, of course, uh, you were to have another split in the ANC, uh, and that really would make a difference, and I therefore have argued that what is happening inside the ANC is, 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 is very important at the moment. Uh, there are intense factional disputes, uh, which I don't think have died down. Uh, I, they will be around. Uh, there are all sorts of regional uh, and factional balancing acts the ANC have to perform in the next five years, and it's not guaranteed that they will perform them adequately, and therefore other splits should happen. Uh, and while I agree with those colleagues who talk about the kind of lock the ANC has, I don't think that one should underestimate the effect which ANC splits can have on the electorate. And just as an, as, as, as an indication, uh, an empirical indication, go back and have a look at what happened in Clockware a while ago in, in the Northwest Province. Uh, there was a split in the ANC in Clockware. The ANC vote in most wards went down from 90% to 50%, and in three wards it went below 50%, and the ANC lost the wards. So I think that there's a lesson in there, uh, and the lesson is that you know if those huge ANC majorities are going to come down, it's going to be because of another split. All of this tends to suggest uh, that a workers' party of, of the kind that NUMSA is talking about uh, has uh, considerable potential. Certainly not potential to get anywhere near uh, a majority, uh, but in theory a potential certainly to get uh, 10 or 15 percent of the vote, which would uh, po quite possibly deprive the ANC of a majority. However, that assumes all sorts of things. Uh, it assumes uh, that NUMSA has the kind of roots uh, among the electorate, that it has the organization on the ground, that the, uh, the left wing of the labor movement have that kind of capacity. Uh, and I think that, uh, that, that, that serious doubts have to be raised about that. So uh, the fact that there is room for a real left-wing party, because I don't see the EFF as a left-wing party, it's, it's in my view it's a, it's a, it's a right-wing right, right nationalist party, uh, that left-wing space is available, but I think we need to ask serious questions about whether uh, the, 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 the trade union movement in its current state or the left of the trade union movement in its current state has the capacity to capitalize on this. Maybe they can make some headway, uh, but I, don't, I, I think one has to be cautious about that. Uh, does that mean uh, that things are, are necessarily simply going to remain the same? Well, not necessarily, um, because... Uh, I don't think, and, and I would certainly disagree with Nomenisa on one issue, uh, I do think that electoral politics matters, not in the sense 
uh, that uh, if we have uh, circulation of elites, we, 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 we have wonderful accountability and we all live happily ever after. I would agree with you that that, 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 is, that tends to happen more in the abstract than in the concrete. But I think certainly, if, if, uh, in my view, uh, having worked on, on citizen action with colleagues across the world and, and having been very influenced uh, by the work, for example, of Partha Chatterjee, who writes about slum, slum dwellers in, 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 in Kolkata and the way in which they're able to, 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 to make their voice heard. Uh, that electoral competition creates opportunities for citizens. I think, I think that's uh, the, the way I would phrase it. So if you look at the way, uh, I mean, we did an exercise. Uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be part of a 12-country study in which we looked at citizen action to influence national policy in 12 countries, uh, and the one startling theme was that in each one of those 12 countries, electoral politics mattered. But it didn't matter in the simplistic sense that if you don't like these guys, you voted for the other guys and then they did what you wanted to do. It was that electoral politics created opportunity, created leverage, which if organized citizens use that particular leverage, uh, uh, has certain effects. Uh, I made the point the other day that if you look in our own context, even in a situation uh, of, of, of an ANC lock on, 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 on national government at one stage, uh, certainly the work I've done on HIV and AIDS uh, suggests that uh, during the darkest period of AIDS denialism in this country, your chances of getting treatment were vastly enhanced if you happened to be in the two provinces where there were electoral competition. Uh, and, and, and I think that there's a lesson in that. So that's, that's the one area I think opportunities are created now which were not there before. The other point which I think is, is worth watching in terms of uh, talk of a social compact uh, is that I argued before the election, and I think I can demonstrate this by reference to the ANC manifesto and the way in which the economic section was phrased, that certainly the ANC's worry uh, about losing voter support before the election was, was impelling it towards de developing a negotiation position on social and economic issues. Uh, if you look at the ANC manifesto, for the first time it actually has a set of of proposals, uh, and it also has a set of, of, of carrots that it's offering business in return. Now, the obvious question that was raised before the election, given that this was probably inspired uh, by concern at losing voter support, uh, is there enough pressure to make that continue? Uh, and I think the tentative answer, these answers always have to be tentative, is yes. Uh, I think despite the points I've made, despite the, the, sl the slow puncture rather than the meltdown, despite the fact that probably the metros aren't really uh, going to go to the opposition, uh, I think that uh, the ANC has enough reason to be concerned uh, about a gradual erosion of support uh, to at least make some effort uh, to, to, to start those social and economic negotiations. Of course, whether those negotiations will actually have any traction, uh, we have to see. Uh, but I think certainly the political impetus to start to, 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 to make them happen is there. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Stephen. Well, before I open um, the uh, discussion to the floor, um, it, there's just one observation that, that I made, um, which I'm interested in teasing out a little bit. Adam, am I right? Did you say that the electorate is to the left of the ANC? The electorate, yeah. uh, is to the left of the ANC. So I, I said that the electoral gap is to the left of the ANC, but I want to use this opportunity to respond to one, one related issue. And that is that I don't think we should start off on the assumption that this debate is about significant change happening if the ANC loses the election. I don't think anybody believes that suddenly next year or in 2019, suddenly the ANC is going to fall from 62% to 22%. Not happening. Nobody believes that. The question is, can the shifts in the ANC's vote reach a point and can the, can the growth of an electoral alternative change behavior patterns and accountability dynamics between political elites in the ANC and citizens? It's about should the ANC drop to a particular level, will it force people in the ANC to behave in ways that could become more responsive to poor communities in one way 
or to more middle class communities in another? That's the interesting question for me. And for me, uh, that's, that's the real issue about how accountabilities get, how accountability dynamics get structured in democracies. Is you don't have to lose the election to change your, to change your behavior pattern. And the question is, accountability dynamics and creating responsiveness is for me, that's the interesting thing. And I think that if you're looking at which is the party that has the potential to creating that potential electoral alternative, not necessarily getting the majority, sending a wake-up call to the, to the ANC, then I'm not so sure that the DA is going to be that in the medium to long term. I think it's going to have to be uh, elements from within the ANC and how those elements from within the ANC configure and how they can combine and configure in ways that, that we've, uh, we've potentially uh, uh, the creation of a viable opposition. And for me, that's the interesting thing and the potential things that, that could happen. One final thing on just numbers. It is interesting that the, ANC, that the DA was about 28, 29% in the Western Cape in 2004. In 10 years, it is now sitting at 60% or 59, 58.5%. Some very quick shifts can happen once there is a perception that the invul invulnerability of the ANC is this thing. And I think one of the big questions and interesting things about the metropoles is not so much how the ward elections work, and I think I agree with uh, Stephen, but the symbolism of losing that 50% could mean fundamental things for the ANC and the politics of, of, of those kinds of questions in the, in the ANC. Okay. Well, I mean, but just go to go back to my question, I'm very interested in trying to understand where is our electorate positioned on the political spectrum? Are they on the left, in the center, on the right? Anybody? I don't want to be impolite. I think if you start using those categories, you get very incoherent <laughs> because you're missing the dynamics. I mean, this is not, you know, those kind of categories don't don't work so neatly here. I mean, identities do matter, uh, and uh, I mean, I still maintain, incidentally, that race is is, is still the fundamental fault line in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to the, the the point, you know, just to illustrate this point and where the EFF phenomenon gets totally confused, uh, and and others have written about this. I mean, I related in a column this week, and I think it's 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 worth repeating because it was actually demonstrated by electoral results. I, I was I was on a panel on Kaya FM and, and Kaya FM, you know, Kaya FM's constituency are, are upper in, you know, prof, arise, upwardly mobile black uh, professionals and, and so forth. And at that stage, I mean, it, it just happened to develop a discussion. Uh, there was a rumor that the ANC was going to appoint a white person, Barbara Creasy, as, as premier. And caller after caller after caller phoned in and said, I am voting for the EFF in Gauteng because I'm not voting for a party that's prepared to consider a white premier. And if you ask them, as John Pillman did, why are you not prepared to vote for a white person? Well, I work in a legal firm and the whites treat us like dirt. And I work in a, factory, I work in a, in a business and the whites don't like, give us any decision making. And that is a major fault line in this country. Now, it's not a left-wing fault line, but the... You know, the angriest people in this country are upwardly mobile black people in the formal sector who think that whites treat them like dirt. And I think that that makes it very difficult uh, to use those kind of categories in our politics. Well, I mean, I, that also speaks to, you know, if the ANC receives a wake-up call, what does the ANC do once it's woken up? What is waking up, cons what is waking up consist of? And I don't think it's necessarily new forms of accountability. Um, you know, I, if Gauteng, I think it's two things. I mean, firstly, I think that many of the, the, the violent protests in Gauteng have to do with the fact that, uh, th that there's been a serious fissure between national and provincial. Um, and uh, much of the violence has been organized around that. And I think that's about to go uh, with, with David Makura's appointment as premier. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, this this rising prosperous defection from, from the ANC, what, what, can, what can come of it? I think that whoever wins that vote speaks to people about being black, as, as Stephen says. I think that that is absolutely crucial. I, I think that people's insecurity associated with upward mobility, deep insecurity, is about being black and upwardly mobile in, in a world dominated by whites for many generations. 
And I don't at the moment see an electoral alternative to the ANC who is going to speak to those people as being black. The DA just can't get there. It's hit a brick wall. It doesn't know how to speak to two constituents at the same time. It's tearing itself apart over that. And as for NUMSA, I mean, the question is, you know, if a new party does form, what is it going to mobilize over? And, and I think a danger for NUMSA is that it's going to mobilize primarily over shop floor issues and over wages. Um, and it's going to push a wage inflationary agenda and it's going to get hammered. Um, and it's, go it, it's going to, to, to wage a, a big battle and lose. Um, and I think that whatever incipient support it has will peel away from that. So, so I, think that, I think that the urban areas remain the ANCs to lose. Um, I, you know, I think they have a massive head start. Um, and, and it's a question of the language they speak and the, and the calibrations they perform. But if, if they do continue losing it, I think it's, it's a, yeah, I, I think it would be due to massive tactical errors in their part and nothing else. Thanks. I'm going to have to exercise some self-discipline because I wanted to ask more questions, but I'm going to open it to the floor. I'm going to take it in batches of three, one, two, and at the back, three. And we'll come back again in the second round to you. One. Um, to all the panelists, thanks. It was fantastic. Um, so I'm if you could uh, just identify yourself also before you ask your question. Sure, that was my next step. Um, I'm Dennis Webster. I'm a graduate student from University of Pretoria. My question, and it's addressed to the panel at large. I hope that someone picks it up. Um, you mentioned it at the start, and then in the general comments at the end, it was picked up, this question of race, um, when at the start it was mentioned that uh, white South Africa voted almost as a bloc uh, for the DA. So one of the things which interested me throughout the elections was why white South Africa is not voting for the ANC, um, considering that life for whites, under, and especially for white capital, um, under ANC rule has comparatively been very good. Um, and and especially uh, because I think that uh, Zuma, in the way that he's sort of alienated from poor black majority, his building of a big house, um, the sort of way that he's able to constantly evade uh, these, uh, this, the way that guilt is chasing him, I think he acts in two ways as a sort of unconscious role model um, for white South Africa. Um, the first way is like, um, uh, he, he can get away with it, so then so can I. Um, and the second way is he's guilty, not me. Um, so in these ways, um, the way in which Zuma acts in, w in such a way as to sort of unconsciously justify white privilege, um, and and because uh, life under under ANC rule has been comparatively um, good for white South Africa, my question is uh, then at the panel of large, why is the ANC not a, a white? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second hand was, um, was it Raymond here? Um, my name is Raymond Sutner. I come from the margins. Um, in the discussion that we've had, uh, there's been a depiction of a type of schizophrenic character amongst the electorate. One day they will be protesting and driving the ANC out of Beckersdahl, uh, supposedly a no-go area, and the next day, 60% vote for the ANC. And I believe that elections are, of, the vote is a very important, hard-won right. And that was why I did not agree with the initial formulation of this uh, vote no campaign, which was calling for a spoilt vote. Uh, because I believe it's an important right. But it is not the only way that people can act politically. Those people who one day uh, want to drive their chiefs out of the area and not fall under their rule may the next day vote for the ANC. So how do we accommodate this? I believe that the NUMSA initiative of a united front is very, very important, but not as purely as an electoral, or not even primarily as an electoral phenomenon. I think it will be important if it responds to the character 
of the current Jacob Zuma-led government, a government of corruption, a government which is undermining the constitution through violence, through uh, uh, patriarchy, and, and through rebantustanization of South Africa. Now, if we look at the formulations of NUMSA up to now, they uh, hover between an all-encompassing unity, which I think is important. Ivan Jim said the other day, there are very many like-minded people who are not socialists, but on the other hand, they use the language of revolutionary socialism and Marxist-Leninism. So what I'm saying is, I don't want to, I know I shouldn't be speaking long, I think that the elections are very important, but that's not the whole of the political terrain, and we need to strengthen uh, uh, the idea of a united movement, which need not even be anti-ANC, anti-DA, or anything, since many of the people who have these problems that are not resolved through the vote uh, would, could well be part of such a movement. Okay. And then there was a, a hand at the back, along the aisle, aisle seat at the back. Thanks. Uh, Sven Forsman from Macquarie. Johnny, you mentioned earlier that a lot of the people you spoke to in the Western Cape um, were quite sympathetic to the wage issues. Um, when, when I met with the CCMA recently, um, they mentioned that only 8% of the 168,000 cases that they had last year related to wages. The rest all related to socioeconomic issues, which uh, talks to Nombaniso's point about the housing. And um, the CCMA had said to me that they thought the strikes would continue until these socio-economic issues are sorted out. Now that the sort of ANC is going to power, do you think they've got the willpower to step in and sort out the platinum strikes, which are becoming a national disaster? Um, so, who wants to deal with why don't whites vote for the ANC? <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, I thought we dealt with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's about identity politics. I mean, you know, Jacob Zuma became, I mean, you know, just, just contemplate this. Jacob Zuma became president of the ANC in 2007. In 2008, there was an American presidential election. And I, I had this kind of mad idea, and I kept on checking it out, and I, I looked at policy, and the more Jacob Zuma spoke in public, I suddenly realized that Jacob Zuma was actually John McCain. Uh, no, no, seriously, he was a social conservative. He tried to, he tried, he, he failed, but he tried to free up, free up the labor markets. <laughs> he, he, he talked about the need for, for, for greater policing, etc. Uh, and, the, and, and, and the point I made at the time was that the John McCain of the ANC was regarded by the white electorate as a mad radical, uh, you know, because he had several wives dressed in leopard skins and sung about machine guns. So, you know, the point I'm making is that that kind of cultural identity politics is what it's all about, and that's why in response to Fazila's question, you know, to look at this in sort of neat left-right categories just doesn't get us anywhere. I mean, quite clearly, if you look at much of the media, academia, etc., I, I mean, the ANC uh, is regarded as anathema not you know, for the reasons that disenchanted ANC people who feel that it's, it's, it's sold out on the struggle uh, site, uh, the ANC is still regarded in, in much of the suburban imaginary as a, as a kind of dangerous left-wing force which is going to one day, you know, sort of dump us in some kind of majority rule hull, etc. So, I, I, you know, I don't think you can understand South African politics if we simply put it in these kind of, you know, neat, neat categories uh, in which people are suddenly stripped of where they come from. Uh, while I have the floor, just to, 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 to support Raymond Sutton's point, I, I think it's spot on and it's, it's the point I'm trying to make. I, I, I think that maybe, I, you know, if I wasn't trying to, I think that the real space at the moment exists in that, that domain that he's talking about. Uh, because I think that, you know, I, I think people are, are expecting change to come through some kind of ANC e electoral defeat. It's, it's not going to happen anytime soon. But, uh, you know, I, I do think <coughs> that opportunities for the kind of social movement uh, politics that he's talking about uh, are, are very much there at the moment. Uh, and I think that it's interesting <coughs> that... Uh, 
NUMSA seems to be uh, thinking uh, solely of, a, well, you know, they're, they're a bit ambiguous about it, but certainly Ivan Jim's recent statements seem to be moving in a direction of a political party. Uh, and, and maybe what they need to think about was the original formulation. Uh, certainly when, uh, you know, at the end of their, their conference, I mean, Andrew Chirwa, who's the new president, uh, was much more circumspect about this, uh, much more circumspect about a party, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, far more concerned to say, well, let's, you know, see who we can form alliances with uh, as a social movement. So, so maybe if that kind of thinking is resurrected, uh, it might actually do more for the social justice agenda in this country than a new party. I want to come back to two sets of issues. The one that uh, Raymond came to, but I want to kick off with this, this debate around identity politics. You see, for me, I think race matters. I don't think it's the only factor that matters. So why do I think whites didn't vote for the ANC? I think some of them because they fear majority rule and that they, it wouldn't matter what, uh, what, what, uh, who was articulating it, whether it was Jacob Zuma or anybody else, they would still not vote for the ANC. But I think there are many others who were turned off for other reasons. I think there were a whole range of people who were turned off by the corruption and in Kanda and how it manifested itself. Not only in the white community, in other communities. And so they're driven not by the fact that they're white. They're driven by the fact that they think that there is a particular policy, uh, that, that there's a particular uh, administration that is particularly prone to a, a degree of corruption. Uh, I think there are a group of others who are frightened by the rhetoric of social democracy that sometimes comes out of the ANC. So the question is, is the debate gets constructed as does race matter? Of course it does matter. Is it the only factor that matters? Does, all, does it mean that if movements happen, white people will not vote for the ANC under any circumstances? I think it'll evolve over periods of time. Depending on who we are talking about, which generations, how do they articulate, what are the policy agendas, I think this thing is far more fluid than people imagine. But that fluidity has to be a product of political imagination and getting people to move. And for me, that's the, the thing. So I would like to, to take it slightly further than I think it's been cast in the, uh, presently. The second is, of course, elections are important, but they do not, are not the only thing that matters. Uh, the real question is how do you, you know, the, for me, creating a responsive political elite to poor people is a trick about how do you give poor people power. And the trick about giving poor people power is two things, in my view. The one is you enable the mobilization of poor people through organization, through activities, through the kinds of actions, civic actions that, uh, that Stephen spoke about and quoted uh, Chattapatarji and others. The second is you divide political elites. Because suddenly, and I often find out that the, most, the time that the ANC became most responsive to its electorate was the time when Jacob Zuma and Tabu Mbeki were fighting. And suddenly, there were a whole range of people in Jacob Zuma's category, camp, who suddenly found out the word neoliberalism, and suddenly began to take uh, much more active positions around HIV AIDS and the provisions of antiretrovirals. And for me, people who couldn't spell neoliberalism suddenly found, became great advocates of a kind of social democracy and a challenge to neoliberalism. And for me, that's the real issue, is dividing elites is as central as mobilizing, uh, mobilizing poor communities and enabling them. And for me, how do you do both? So the question about the NUMSA thing for me is actually that it should do both, that it should be part of a united front mobilizing in the kinds of activities. But I do think that so long as the ANC is as comfortable as it is electorally. It's a problem. And so actually competing on an electoral uh, platform is important and slowly eroding it. And I don't think that means the first time the NUMSA party were to become and this thing, and even if it's successful, it's going to suddenly win 52%. But I think a strong showing on the basis of an organizational presence, on the basis of some legitimacy, can send up serious wake-up calls. And those wake-up calls are about 
the ANC in Gauteng wondering, excuse me, did we lose to the DA? Or did we lose to a whole range of people that are coming to us from broadly the left? The, the big challenge for me is precisely what Johnny mentioned. Is does the NUMSA alternative suddenly get constructed on narrow wage issues? Or is it able to articulate a message that is able to appeal to a range of people on ETOs that can construct a, a lower middle class, working class people against ETOs and look at an alternative imagination of how to fund it? Uh, issues around wages and provisions of education is a much more multi class issue. Issues around provide, providing health care is a much more uh, this thing. So it needs to imagine the political program in a much more imaginative way than simply wage issues. And part of that documentation coming out of this does suggest this. My only other worry, however, about such, a, such an initiative is if it's imagining this in a much more wider way, it must be able to construct alternatives that seem reasonable to that broad alliance. And I think it's possible to do. I don't think the debate is about capitalism versus socialism. I don't think the issue and the debate is about whether you can have a youth wage subsidy or not. I think there are much more nuanced ways about how you can construct an alliance of industri industrial policy that brings certain sections of manufacturing capital together with sections of the working class, together with sections of the organized workers in a conversation and are unemployed in conversations that may benefit them each other. The question is you have to be, go beyond narrow wage questions to an imagination of a political program that attracts a wider layer. And so we need a level of political sophistication on the left. And sometimes they write the sophistication, but when they articulate it, they lose that. And for me, you know, why people vote and don't vote isn't because they read policy documents. It's the imagery that is created by political leadership. And for me, that imagery needs a greater sophistication than they got. And one final thing, and it's a one sentence thing. I find one of the most interesting political leaders in South Africa from the trade union movement as well as Zima Vavi. And what fascinates me about this, this is not whether he's good or bad. It's how many white middle class people in Parkview will say to you, you know, I can't agree with entirely what he says. Hey, but he's actually quite good and I could vote for the guy. And it's interesting that you would have that guy, that it is possible to construct beyond the narrow class confines that people imagine we define. So uh, the question uh, puts me, the, well, the, the first part of your question is what will happen, what will the outcome of the platinum strike be? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. The future always surprises, it certainly always surprises me. But once you've asked, um, I mean, from the moment the strike began at, at Implatz before Americana, um, I mean, it built extraordinary solidarity among workers, extraordinary solidarity. And up until now, they've won each battle. They won that battle at Implatz. They then won at Lonman. Um, and I think they're now not going to stop until they win the last victory, too. Um, I, I think they have a, a history of victories over the last two years. Their, their solidarity is now sown in blood, um, and they're not going to let go. I, I think that what mining companies have done the last two weeks has only uh, uh, made the solidarity stronger. The, the cell phone campaign was a disaster. Uh, Chris Gr Griffith's comments have been an absolute disaster. I, I think eventually they're going to win and get their demands, and whether the platinum industry survives under those conditions, we shall see. I am deeply uncomfortable, personally, with foregrounding the NUMSA moment. Um, as a social movement moment. Um, as a feminist, I, I, with all due respect, the trade union movement is not where I look for any form of liberation, for any form of solidarity. So for me to be able to consider NUMSA, for me to be able to consider the split in Kosatu as having any significance um, in our politics that does not erase me as as a, as a woman, as a black woman at that, I believe that there's a whole range of stuff that is unresolved. 
and it's not only related to, to, to Vavi's um, sexual misdemeanor in the office, it's the whole language and the, and the issue around which NUMSA actually built solidarity with Vavi. So I'm sorry to say that um, they're not the guys that I want to be on the same picketing line with because I'm afraid that they're, they're going to grow up my groans at a particular moment. And I think it is these untidy issues that, that bring us together but also set us apart that I think are very problem, uh, that, that are, are going to be very important in the past. I have very discomfort with the fact that in most platforms, I always have to bring up the complexity of, of minerals ownership beyond class, beyond the capitalist class, the, the rural urban issue, and, and, the, and, and sexual politics in South Africa, which, me, which takes me to the final point, that if indeed we are serious about um, the, 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 you know, people on the margins liberating themselves, I do think, or, 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 or having some leverage, I do think that we need to understand them a little bit more. We certainly move, my brother, from very, in, in very different circles, because in the circles that I move in, which is not the middle class circles, in working class women's circles, Vavi is one of, Vavi and Zuma actually are spoken of interchangeably. But I'm going to take one more round of questions and we're going to start with Ambassador Anders Hegelberg um, and then the gentleman in front of him. Um, and then there's a hand over here. I'm going to move to the side of the room and the one at the back, that's four. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Swedish ambassador. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you about the expected policy response of this outcome. Uh, uh, even if you are not all agreeing that we have a left-right uh, diversion, but uh, uh, indeed, uh, do you expect uh, ANC and the government to respond to become more radicalized, to try to meet some pressure from the leftish? Uh, will this response mainly be rhetorical or do you expect it also to be substantial? Would it mean that implementation of national development plan maybe will be more difficult? And at the other flank from democratic alliance, how, uh, if you are meeting a pressure from the left, what happens uh, when you should try to protect your interests to the other side? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dinga, and I must say I come from NUMSA. I'm at head office of NUMSA, <laughs> and I head the education department of NUMSA. Um, and I, I mean, I, 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 I think the, the comments that have been made uh, about what's called the NUMSA moment, and I'm taking copious notes and uh, trying to reflect on that. So. Um, just just a, 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 f a few points. I, I think as, as a union, we, we, we recognize that the shadow of the ANC is going to be with us for a long, long time. We have no illusion about that. And this is also reflected in how we take policies within the union. And when we had our special congress, and there was this question about how to vote in 2014, some of the participants at the Congress said, look, they're prepared to go with what the union says, but don't ask me to cut myself in the middle between my role as the chair of the ANC in Tanzania and my identity as a NUMSA member. And you'll find in our uh, formulation of the resolution, we did try to strike the balance because we recognize the, this, uh, the, this power of, 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 of the ANC and, and why it's going to be with us for a long, long time. The second thing uh, 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 that's uh, important, which I'm taking from, from, from people, is that I think there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on NUMSA forming a political party and, and all of that. And, and, and a little about what we're doing about uh, the sort of the building of what we call a, a united front. And again, to us, this idea of a united front is not, you know, like the UDF in 1983 with patrons and presidents and all of that, is about joining together struggles on the ground, uh, joining the dots between uh, different communities that are involved in struggles. And, and we've been careful, I mean, just to, 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 to say to people that uh, 
you know, we are concerned about the shop floor. The first campaign that we launched was not about, you know, the sort of employment tax incentive. If it is about uh, youth unemployment, which affects uh, uh, workers who send their kids and who graduate who don't get uh, jobs after that. It's, got, it's about middle classes who send their kids and are faced with graduate unemployment. And the phrasing of that campaign was, in a way, Raymond, uh, uh, to ensure that there is a popular appeal uh, uh, in, what, in, what, in, what, in what we do. Uh, I think we were the first on the before the Inkandla, before all of this, to raise the question of uh, Inkandla and what must happen to it, even before the public uh, protector it announced, and how that should be taken up uh, as an anti-corruption uh, 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 measure. Uh, the, the last thing I want, want to say is that for, for us, uh, it's important to build this uh, broad coalition. And, and uh, you must number one to admit that when the traditional courts bill, yes. okay. uh, when <laughs> we were the only union, yes. we were the we were the only union, and we are trying. I mean, and and and, and this 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 is, this is a this is important for for the panelists because these are things that we're grappling with yeah. because sometimes we find that uh, the workers who work in the factory they also have roots in the countryside. And we are trying to explore to find uh, these uh, multiple identities so that a discussion that Numboniso was part of in Numsa, but the traditional courts bill, had an echo amongst the workers because they knew what would happen when they go home. And, 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 and in this way, we are trying to find connections between what is part of the year an urban proletarian and some part of the year the people have a, a family in, in, in that. And we are trying to, to, to find that. The last qu question which I didn't hear from, from the people that we are struggling with is that uh, we, we don't talk about the working class broadly in NUMSA because we have a, a, an, a, an, a, an understanding of the fragmentation that has happened to that section of, 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 of the community. And that uh, we are struggling and exploring ways of finding connections between people who have a job and people who don't have a job. Our members and the surveys we've done, you know, will have a medical aid, and we found that 56% of the people own their houses or their bonds. And how do you link this uh, with the shared dwellers? And we think that uh, the issues around questions of unemployment, the questions of issues of democracy, police brutality, uh, some of the civil liberties and that, maybe the things that will bring this united front together. And I think that sometimes people get carried about some of the sound bites about a political party. Anyway, there's no decision in NUMS about forming a political party. It's about exploring the possibility of a movement. And, and, and I think that uh, sometimes the sound bites about the party uh, get so pronounced that the actual work of building the united front gets uh, uh, forgotten. Um, thank you. My name is Vinayak. I'm from the MNG Center for Investigative Journalism. So a question for uh, Johnny and, and perhaps Prof. Friedman. Um, we've discussed a lot of the domestic factors and, and how they'll play out in the ANC's uh, reign or, or you know, non-reign. Uh, could, could, they, could they also discuss briefly what sort of impact international dynamics will have uh, on changing support for ANC? I say this, you know, mindful that globally um, quantitative easing, this thing that America has been doing, which has made emerging market economies more attractive for international investors, is ending. Um, and the, the demand for South Africa's primary products, which are its key exports, is diminishing. And, and how that will play out in ANC's continued support or lack thereof. My name is David L Lewis. Can I, I just make a, a point based on a very banal arithmetic observation that if we were a two-party system and, and the, the, the winner got 62%, you wouldn't be interested in election outcomes for the foreseeable future. In fact, even where, as in Gauteng, the winner got 53%, you wouldn't be interested in electoral outcomes for the foreseeable future. It would be considered to be a, a landslide. Um, because the swing that is required for a change in the electoral outcome is too great for elections to be to be interesting. And so I think that even in, 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 in Gauteng, 
the, the worst that the aid, and, and so, but we're not a two-party system. So those, those figures are even less interesting because even in Gauteng, there are 20 percentage points or more that separate the, the ANC from the next largest uh, party. So that the worst that the ANC, uh, that portends for the ANC in the foreseeable future is having to rule in a coalition which I should point out, the Indian Congress has ruled, ruled in in India for most of its, uh, its 60 years. And the, the, the mode of ruling in a coalition is about patronage. Essentially, it's about patronage. And this is something that both the Indian Congress have been very good at, and it's something that the ANC are very good at. It's kept those respective two parties together in the case of the Indian Congress for 60 years, in the case of the ANC now for 15 to 20 years. And so I think that the response to the, 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 any perceived threat that the ANC faces is not going to be a policy response as was suggested in Business Day the other day where Johnny thought that they would orient more to, to winning back the urban vote and, and Anthony Butler thought that they would orient more towards consolidating their rural base. I think it's going to be an orgy of patronage because that's what they're good at. That's what they've done well, what they've done effectively, and I think that that's, that's what you'll see in, in response to this. The only time, I agree with Stephen, the only time it gets threatening for the ANC is if the ANC fragments. And it's incredibly difficult to see whether it does fragment, where the various fragments will, will go to politically. But I also think that to prevent that fragmentation, uh, the, the, the strongest inclination will be to do what has been done in the past, and that is to consolidate it by, to cement it through, through patronage. And, and, and so I think for, for those who think that uh, corruption, for example, is going to become anything less of a problem and a less prevalent phenomenon, uh, well, that's, I, ho I hope that that's so, and, uh, but uh, the, the political portent for that is not, is not, is not great. Hi, um, my name's Daniel Brody. I'm from an NGO called Good Governance Africa. My question is this, that um, if, uh, as some of the speakers have raised as a possibility, a, a, a meaningful and potent leftist party does emerge um, that looks like it's, it's gaining uh, popular support, do you think we could see white voters begin to ditch the DA and start voting for the ANC as a, as a sort of uh, lesser of two evils. So let's start here and then you, Adam. Um, uh, the ambassador's question, I mean, being absolutely mindful of, of how Stephen has problematized left and right, I mean, I, I, I think a possible policy response would be what many people in this room would consider a shift a little to the right. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think the ANC is worried about Gauteng. And I mean, I would, I would guess that it is out to consolidate a, a, a middle-class alliance and get a middle-class back behind it. And I think that entails many things, but one may be taking on a big union issue, which is, which is labor market law. Um, I, I think it may go for it this term uh, with capital behind it. But in exchange, I think it's going to increasingly want to control big chunks of equity um, and distribute them um, to constituents, a form of patronage, David. And, and I think that's going to be a big exchange with, with capital. Um, take on labor, but command a lot of equity. I think it's going to be talking a great deal more about the professions and about affirmative action and supporting black people in the professions. Um, I think it's going to keep civil service uh, unions very close. Um, I think it's going to do all the things that irritate white people enormously. <laughs> it's going to talk affirmative action, it's going to talk equity, black economic empowerment. Um, I, I, I think that's probably the way in which it's going to try and consolidate and take back uh, big chunks of, of, of Gauteng. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a guess. Internationally, I mean, I mean, I think it goes back to what I was initially saying right at the beginning, which is how the ANC interprets people's pain. Uh, whether it has command over the debate about why people are feeling pain. Uh, you know, since how many jobs have been lost since late 2007? About a million. Uh, so far, it's managed to um, do pretty well in the debate about why that happened and what it means. Um, 
but yes, I mean, further job losses, further trouble, uh, uh, further economic fragility tests its hegemony, it tests its capacity to explain those things. Um, so far, I think it's done pretty well. Um, I mean, really interesting points about the DA. I, I mean, Tony Leon in another context said the other day that he can see the DA going the way of the United Party, trying to be a little bit to everybody and, and becoming nothing. Um, and it certainly may do that. It, it is, I, think that it's, I think it's struggling to talk to various constituencies in the same language and literally doesn't know how. Um, and if that does happen, then its white support, I think, will splinter in many directions, and perhaps some to the ANC, particularly if somebody like Sil Ramaphosa takes over. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to come back. I mean, I want to start off with the orgy of patronage. Because frankly, I don't think that's the only party, that that's the only description of the ANC. I think that it, it speaks to one element of, the, of, of what exists. But it's not the only thing. The ANC is much more than simply an orgy of patronage over the last 20 years. If you simply drive through Soweto, you'll see that there has been a series of interventions in the urban polity that have made fundamental differences. That you'll see the elements of a kind of social democratic agenda that have manifested themselves in, in welfare grants and other things. You will see elements of a kind of schizophrenic approach to economic policy. So I don't think the orgy of patronage is the only description there is. There's clearly one part of it. But it's a much more complex phenomenon that we, we're seeing. And I think to simply imagine that the next five years is going to be exactly only about that is, I think, to miss the complexity of our, of our existence. I actually think if you want to know what's going to happen in the next five years, look at the last five. And I think that there are certain things in the National Development Plan that appealed to our large layer of the class sector. Uh, educational reform and intervention. I think the ANC is going to prioritize that in a big way. Uh, I think healthcare and making it accessible to a wider layer of people. I think there's going to be a large layer of big interventions in that regard. I think infrastructure and focusing on infrastructural development and fixing the kinds of interventions around electricity deficits that we have in some of those areas. I think there's going to be a large amount of interventions in that regard. Uh, do I think they're going to fundamentally shift and address inequality? I think there's large elements that are, would love to do it, uh, but I don't think they have the political uh, chutzpah and courage to make the hard choices that, that needs to happen in this regard. So I think on economic policy, you'll continue to get the kind of fractured debate that you can is there'll be a conversation and whenever there's a need to make the hard choices like happened in the National Development Plan, uh, we'll see people balking and pulling back. So I don't think they're going to act against the Labor Relations Act in any significant way. I think they'll make mumbles and grumbles and when they have to have hard, make hard choices, the prospect of the challenges emanating from Kosatu and uniting the Kosatu factions which suddenly they'll balk at and they'll pull back in. So in a lot of ways, on economic policy and labor market policy, I imagine very much of the kinds of challenges that need to happen. And that poses the question around that you pose. In a world, in an international environment, where the kind of easy money is going to disappear, the kind of share options, and the inflation of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange is going to disappear, how are they going to deal with that kind of stuff? And I think that's the thing, and they're going to kind of in this crisis, because it's going to create serious deficits at multiple levels, they're going to try to do something, balk at the consequences, pull back, and you'll saw this over the last four or five years. It's only going to become slightly more complex and harder given the fact that the days of easy money are gone uh, and we've begun to see this. So for me, that's the, the, real, the real thing that I, I think we, we're looking at. I think that the issue for me and your commentary, I tell you what I think is the issue. I think if, you, if NUMSA were only to do the united front, I think it will not have the impact that NUMSA hopes for. I think if NUMSA were only to do the electoral party option, it will not have, uh, be able to do that. I think the real trick is to do both, and how to do both in the kinds of, and how that, that evolves. Because I don't think one or the other is going to pull it off. I think it's that complexity that needs to come together. And I think that's the big challenge uh, that you have. I, 
going forward, I mean, I wouldn't describe the next five years as a dictatorship, actually. Uh, you know, I think that's, it is a democratic process. These guys won 62% of the vote. And while I think they are falling, and I don't think this is all about them losing, I, and I think that there is some merit in looking at electoral reform, I would be very reluctant to describe this as a, as a dictatorship. I think it's a real manipulation of the term in all kinds of ways. Do I think the ANC uh, would vote? Do I think whites would vote for the ANC? Actually, yeah, but I think there's a whole range of whites, particularly in the liberal elite, who might vote for a kind of potential left-wing party, not so much because they actually buy what the, that left-wing party says, because there's a strong element in the liberal intelligentsia about the need for accountability and creating a viable electoral alternative. And I think that part might, might influence a whole series of people to, uh, to vote. And, and that's, for me, the way I think the real debate lies, is can you construct an option of, of a, I'll tell, you know what for me is the big dilemma, and I want to end here. I go into a polling booth, and I look at the ANC, and I'm going to put there, and I stop at the moment, and I say, the bloody inefficiency, the bloody corruption. And then I look at the DA, and I say, the bloody conservatism of these bloody buggers. And you're looking, and you're kind of saying, who the hell? And I think there's a lot of people in that, in that dilemma. And actually, I think a, a kind of social democratic party that can weave a political program, that can have a leadership that appeals to a cross-section of people, that can articulate a broad social democracy, that can talk about the kinds of issues that Dinga talked about without articulating it in the kinds of extreme ways. That party has the potential to eclipse at least the DA. And by eclipsing the DA, it opens up a conversation that we've not imagined and the possibilities that we've not imagined. Yeah, look, try <coughs> just try and deal with some things briefly. Just to respond to the ambassador, I mean, look, you know, I, I, can't, I, I think instead of speculating, one, one has to look at what is actually being talked about, what is actually on the table at the moment. And as I said earlier, I, I think that there are two things in the minds of ANC policymakers, and I think you see that in the documents, you see that in the discussions. The one is, uh, and, and, and quite frankly, I think that, you know, I, I sort of tear my hair out at this kind of national myth of the NDP. Uh, you know, I, I, I have this sort of party trick at various discussions where you land up in various groups and you say, how many people here think we should implement the NDP? And 20 hands go up and you say, how many people have read the NDP? And zero hands go up. Because the NDP has become kind of fantasized into something that's not. It's a, it's a very long rambling, sometimes internally contradictory document, which depending on where you stand on the political spectrum has got some good ideas and some bad ideas, and, and it's not a charter for anything. But when the ANC says that it's adopted the NDP, what they're actually saying is that they've adopted that part of the NDP which is immediately within their power, uh, and that is the part about the capable state. That is the part about making government run better. And now whether you think government will actually run better is another story altogether. But, uh, but my job is simply to tell you what is in the minds of the policy makers. So I think that there is a push from sections of the ANC to respond to this by trying to make government run better. The other thing is the point I made earlier. If you look, at, and, and, and I, I don't think the, I think the, electorate, uh, the election may just have added steam to this. If you look at the documents on, on social economic issues over the last year, they're very interesting. Because what they have is a lot of rhetoric about the need for radical change and no proposals for radical change. Uh, and what that means is a sense that you have a problem, that poverty and inequality is a problem, as ANC policymakers read it, but you can't actually impose anything because uh, that will cause, in, uh, in their view, more damage than harm. Uh, and therefore, it comes out uh, as, as a program for negotiation. And I guess if you assume that 
uh, you know, Cyril Ramaphosa, as, as deputy president, uh, has, has all sorts of cachet with the business community. Uh, that would seem to be where they're going at the moment. Whether they, the, the things then change uh, in, the, in the direction people are suggesting, I, I, I think is speculative, and, and, and uh, we, need to, we, we need to see how things develop. Uh, as far as the point about international dynamics is concerned, reflect on the following, okay? From 2008, okay, we didn't come out particularly well from the international crisis. We shed half a million jobs, okay, and the political effect was fairly marginal. The labor relations effect was acute. I mean, we, you know, I, I, I think there's certainly a lot of evidence to suggest uh, that the kind of pressure which was put on the bargaining system uh, had something to do with, 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 with problems in the mining industry. But even then, uh, that has been largely contained. Uh, and, and, and people seem to be prepared uh, to accept uh, in many cases. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, you know, I have to be careful what I say about conciliation because I'm now connected to the CCMA by marriage. But uh, as a result of that, you know, you talk to, to people at the CCMA uh, and they talk about these negotiations, you know, where the union comes along and says, I, we demand 60% and the employer says you can only have 5% and you say to them, well, what happened? Oh, no, we settled at eight and a half, you know. So... I think that there's some, uh, the point that I'm making is that, uh, and I'm not making a value judgment about it, is that, uh, you know, it may be the effect of a segmented economy in which, uh, you know, the, 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 because people are very often shut off from the formal economy, uh, you know, the effects of these fluctuations don't actually have the kind of impact which, which, which the textbooks say they are. But the reality is that, uh, you know, the only empirical <laughs> evidence we have is what happens in the last five years, uh, and it doesn't suggest that those international economic factors are going to bite here to quite the extent uh, that they have bitten in, 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 in some other countries, uh, politically, rather than economically. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think David Lewis, uh, you know, patronage is certainly a possibility, uh, uh, and uh, certainly I don't think that you will be out of a job any time <laughs> in the next 10 years. Uh, I think the one intriguing point, which we haven't discussed this evening, is sufficiently because it isn't, you know, it isn't part of the, the, the poverty and inequality agenda, is... Uh, you know, I th I, I'm not sure that patronage sorts out the black middle class problem. Yes, uh, there is a section of the black middle class which is locked into the public sector. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you're one of those angry accountants or lawyers who, 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 who is being pushed around by white, you know, you feel be pushed around by white people in your workplace, uh, I'm not sure that patronage is what you're looking for. You, you're looking for some sort of political support. So I think that uh, the ANC's relationship with the black middle class may turn out to be uh, a, a lot more complicated than we think. Uh, then just uh, a couple of points. Uh, look, uh, you know, maybe I'm, a, uh, I'm an identity essentialist. Uh, <coughs> identities do change, but uh, changing sufficiently to have large numbers of white folks voting for the ANC, uh, no, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, incidentally, I think that you may well find, I mean, people tend to, you know, we talk about the extent to which the ANC relies on certain identities. Yes, it's in a different space. Uh, the DA is as much an identity party as the ANC is. I, I mean, just a, a weird sort of number which, 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 which intrigues me. If you extract domestic workers from the equation because the, the, the voting results in urban vote, in suburban voting districts uh, include domestic workers, if you, if you do a, a strict rule of thumb and take domestic workers out of the equation, the average DA vote in most suburban voting districts in the major cities is 95 to 98 percent. Okay, so I mean, that, that, is, that is a form of tribalism which is now totally beyond the ANC in the, in, 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 in the townships. And I don't see those folks shifting anywhere. I, I, I think they're, <coughs> they're at home. Uh, you know, uh, maybe if... Uh, you know, the Tony Leons of this world don't like particularly much what is happening, but, you know, unless he goes to the Freedom Front Plus, I'm afraid, you know, he's stuck with the only game in town, and I think he's, he's quite indicative of a lot of other people. And then finally, I think recall would be a great idea, uh, but, 
you know, part of what I'm, I'm trying to convey this evening is that we don't live in a dictatorship. And, and, and that's not because the people who govern are necessarily nice, and that's not because democracy works wonderfully for everybody. Uh, it is simply that if you have the kind of system we have, there are opportunities for organized citizens to exercise voice, uh, which don't exist if you don't have that system. Uh, and I guess what some of us are saying is, is, is simply uh, let's look at those opportunities and let's see what openings that uh, that uh, they suggest. Uh, and and quite frankly, you know, uh, maybe I'm too influenced by my particular case study. Uh, you know, but if you can win the battle for comprehensive treatment for HIV and AIDS uh, in a highly top-down system in which the governing party gets 64 <laughs> percent, maybe the prospects are a lot greater than we think they are. Well, um, talking about the last five years. Um, and then and the relationship with the next five years. We have a very interesting um, basket of laws that are coming, which I think are going to change uh, people's lives fundamentally. Um, the land restitution was passed just before elections. We have a big case against the land restitution. Um, and the question is whether we get that before the changes in the Constitutional Court, because there are two judges that are coming up in the Constitutional Court, uh, two vacancies that need to be filled. I don't imagine that those are going to be filled by uh, people that are likely to be different from Mokhweng Mokhweng. Um, uh, I'm glad that nobody's proposing that the NDP is necessarily in its entirety um, going to be um, perhaps the way the ANC is going to go, because I certainly have very serious concerns about areas of silence um, on the NDP. And if you want to check that, you can go to the website of SWAP or on YouTube where I spoke um, extensively on what it is that the NDP talks about and what it is that it doesn't talk about, which is pretty much what we've done in this room. Um, when you look at um, the relationship between the new, the, the amendment to the Mining Act, the, you know, the amendment that went through to Parliament last year, through in Parliament last year. When you look at the big battle that is coming up on the land restitution, when you look at um, the, this big animal that it is called the Traditional Courts Bill, that is undefeatable and which is coming in an even more complicated, which is called the National Traditional Affairs Bill, I think South Africa is pretty sewn up for the next 20, 20 years. Um, Basically, it's changing the economic arrangement in the country. Um, the platinum belt, as we know it, um, is again going to change into something else. Uh, it will remain called the platinum belt. If we um, think that the platinum strike right now is, is the most terrible thing that is happening, I think we need to wait until actually capital re reveals its hand, which I think it will. I'm not that optimistic that the platinum strike is going to be resolved very soon. I do believe that at the moment people are looking at different options and some of those options are, are chemicals and minerals that are easier to, to mine than platinum. And South Africa is not going to be the only country, the first country that um, abandons 200 years of platinum um, in, 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 in storage. You can look at Eastern Europe, you can look at other countries it is happening, and it certainly happens very well. I think that it's very important to bear in mind that the platinum that we're trading in, or that we're trading with at the moment, are, in fact, the reserves. Um, so the crisis that uh, the platinum industry talks about is a crisis in the main that is being felt by the platinum, uh, by, by the mine workers in, in the platinum belt. I'm not saying everybody, but if you look at different companies, they've got lots of stocks in reserves. And for me, uh, in terms of the work that I do, raises a whole range of other issues. I do think that what we are going to see that I'm certain about, whether you have uh, a recall or not, um, is an ANC that becomes more and more pseudo-conservative in nationalistic terms, because that really is not um, the issue, actually. The issue is about protecting economic interests. I think it's very important for us to understand the fact that the distinction between capital and the ANC or capital and the DA and, um, and a whole range of other political uh, players 
is not quite as clear cut as it used to be. Folks have interest in stocks. Uh, NUM has interest in stocks. NUMSA has interest uh, in its investment companies. And it presents a very, very complex issue. These are things that are very untidy to talk about. But these are issues where these overlaps become even more problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Nambaniso. We've come to the end of our program for today. I mean, it's the question we started off with, is the ANC going to rule until Jesus returns, as their, their supporters say? It's evident that they're, in, they're going to be in for the long haul. The question Adam pointed out very acutely was, how do we hold them accountable? The concern for me after our discussion is, how does a socially divided society, one where there's no social solidarity, one that's racially divided, one where there's geographic divisions, how are we going to agree on what to hold this government accountable to?